If we were to create a list of the most popular psychology experiments, the Stanford Prison Experiment would undoubtedly occupy one of the top positions. This experiment, which revealed how individuals succumb to social roles and how those given power can quickly become corrupt, would be either the first or second on the list. It's one of the first experiments that anyone, including YouTubers and newcomers to science, learns about. Especially in places like the overly politically active United States, this experiment provides a fantastic source of data that factions could use to label each other as sheep. Chances are you haven't missed hearing about the Stanford Prison Experiment as it's practically ubiquitous. However, I assure you, as with many other topics, you likely haven't heard the whole story and the issues related to the experiment. Yes, unfortunately, even psychology students who have studied this topic from textbooks are included in this. So let's take a look at this famous obedience experiment in this video first, then we'll learn why we need to approach the significant conclusions drawn from this experiment with much more caution. If you're ready, let's get started. Philip Zimbardo, a social psychologist, made a decision in 1971 to conduct an experiment that explored how individuals react to social roles. For this experiment, a faux prison was constructed in the basement of Stanford University's psychology department, measuring 35 feet. Placing an advertisement in the newspaper, he selected 24 male students for the experiment, randomly dividing them into two groups, half as guards and the other half as prisoners. The participants were informed in advance that this experiment would last for two weeks, simulating a prison environment and they would be paid $15 per day, which is approximately $150 in today's currency. The prisoner's task was to obey the orders of the guards throughout the duration of the experiment. The guards, on the other hand, were instructed to be as tough as possible without resorting to violence in order to assert their authority over the prisoners. For instance, those assigned the role of guards could create a sense of boredom and even fear among the prisoners. They could make them feel entirely controlled by the system, which meant the prison guards. The aim was to eliminate any sense of private life for the prisoners, stripping them of their individuality. For example, the prisoners wouldn't be addressed by their names. They would only be referred to by randomly assigned numbers that were also sewn onto their uniforms. Zimbardo explained to the guards that this treatment would eventually lead to the prisoners feeling powerless. He told them, in the end, we'll have all the power and they'll have none. Following this briefing, the guards were dressed just like real guards and given wooden batons. The prisoners, meanwhile, exist that were dressed in quite uncomfortable prisoner outfits, complete with chains on their wrists. The arrival of the participants in the experiment was equally sensational. Paid off-duty Palo Alto police officers arrested 12 of the prisoners in front of their homes. They charged them with armed robbery and forcibly transported them to the experimental site. The prisoners went through all the procedures of a real arrest, including fingerprinting and mug shots. After these procedures at the police station, they were transferred to the mock prison in an actual prisoner transport vehicle. Imagine just for a moment putting yourself in the shoes of the participants in this experiment. It's chilling, isn't it? Like the beginning of a gruesome Hollywood movie, which, to be honest, wouldn't have been much different from the outcomes later adapted to the silver screen of a horror film. In the narrow cells of the prison, three prisoners were accommodated. The prisoners had access to a small prison yard. In contrast, the guards had a considerably larger and more comfortable area. The guards worked in teams of three during eight-hour shifts. They could return home at the end of their shifts. The prisoners, however, were always required to stay within the artificial boundaries of the prison. The experiment began this way, and after a relatively smooth first day, things started to unravel on the second day. On the second day, the prisoners in cell one barricaded their doors with their beds, removed their clothes, and refused to follow orders, stating that they wouldn't listen to the guards anymore. In other words, a rebellion had begun. In response, the guards used fire extinguishers on the prisoners, stripped them of all their clothing, and isolated the ringleaders, referring to a dark closet as the hole. 
Events unfolded in this manner, and within just a few days, seemingly ordinary and normal university students turned into wildly sadistic guards and increasingly timid prisoners. For instance, the guards started to create special cells for those who didn't participate in the rebellion, where they were rewarded. Similarly, the rebellious prisoners were forced to sleep on metal beds after their bed sheets and mattresses were taken away. Even though it was against the rules, the guards began applying violence secretly and then openly to the prisoners, for example. Even refused to eat were sent to the hole. The guards started making arbitrary decisions during roll calls and forced the prisoners to do push-ups. They prevented them from using the toilet and demanded that they defecate in a bucket in front of their cells. The guards tried to do anything that would humiliate the prisoners. Underneath all this pressure, the prisoners started to exhibit increasingly troubled psychological states, and the first signs of a breakdown occurred just 36 hours into the experiment. Prisoner 8612, as described by Zimbardo, began to display insane behaviours. Zimbardo recounts 8612 began to act crazy, to scream, to curse, to go into a rage that seemed out of control. It took quite a while before we became convinced that he was really suffering and that we had to release him. Over the next couple of days, the prisoners started to distance themselves from one another. The rebellious ones and those who did not participate in the rebellion began accusing each other of snitching. This negative atmosphere ultimately led to prisoner 8119 having a breakdown on the sixth day. He began to sob uncontrollably in his cell and a priest was brought in to help him, but he asked to speak to a doctor. Unable to contain the situation, Zimbardo revealed to him that this was an experiment, reminding him of his true identity and had to release him as well. Interestingly, during his removal from the experiment, the other prisoners taunted him by chanting, 8Y9 is a bad prisoner, 8Y10 is a bad prisoner. On the fifth day, the prisoners were allowed to meet their families. However, just like in a real prison environment, these visits were severely limited and tightly controlled by the guards. The prisoners had to wait for hours to see their loved ones, and they were only allowed a brief 10-minute interaction. Families were shocked at the condition their children had fallen into within just five days, and some parents even mentioned that they would call lawyers. On the same day, Zimbardo's colleagues, Gordon Bauer and Christina Maslach, visited the experimental site. They couldn't believe what they saw. Uh, the guards were making the prisoners wear bags on their heads and sit that way. Both of them expressed that this experiment was not ethical, and Zimbardo had completely abandoned his role as a neutral prison superintendent. Unbelievable, isn't it? As a result of all these events, Zimbardo decided to end the experiment prematurely on the sixth day, eight days before its intended duration. Uh, he gathered all the participants, paid them their earnings for 14 days, which amounted to $2,100 in today's money, and had individual conversations with each of them, recounting everything he observed during the experiment. Additionally, a few weeks later, he sent them a questionnaire by mail, asking them to share their thoughts and feelings after some time had passed. Zimbardo detailed all these findings in his book titled The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil. You can find various YouTube channels and documentaries that present this narrative with different formats and details. In fact, films like The Experiment in 2001 and The Stanford Prison Experiment in 2015 were also created. You can watch those too. However, the issue lies in the fact that only a few of them discuss the scientific issues of the experiment. Without addressing these concerns, any conclusions drawn from the experiment would either be incomplete or incorrect. Let's resolve this matter. First and foremost, it's needless to say that this experiment did not adhere to modern ethical standards. In modern science, unless you have a very compelling reason, you cannot do anything that could potentially cause psychological or especially physical harm to the participants. Zimbardo completely disregarded this ruler. In my opinion, what Zimbardo did by offering money as an incentive is a prime example of unethical manipulation and is absolutely unacceptable. But more importantly, 
Zimbardo kept the original records and documents of the experiment hidden for a whopping 48 years. The only source of information we could access about the experiment was his published book. Even with this limited information, it was clear that Zimbardo's conclusions drawn from the experiment were highly debatable. For instance, Zimbardo himself exhibited behaviours that reinforced the aggressiveness of the guards during the experiment. This indicated that instead of the guards naturally turning into monsters, they became monstrous with Zimbardo's encouragement to test the boundaries of their assigned roles. This is what we call demand characteristics. Subjects tend to behave in ways they think the researchers expect them to. This renders the results of the experiment entirely unreliable. Therefore, Zimbardo's conclusions, such as the idea that people inevitably become monsters when given power, seem to arise from an actor's overly realistic role-playing. They're simply doing what they believed was expected of them. There's nothing abnormal about that. Here's the kicker. In 2019, when Zimbardo finally allowed other researchers to examine the original documents, hidden issues began to emerge. Experts who examined these documents found that the initial selection process of the participants wasn't even random. On the contrary, all the selected students from the applicants had above average scores in dimensions like aggression, authoritarianism, Machiavellianism, narcissism and social dominance, and below average scores in areas like empathy and altruism. In other words, words, these subjects weren't becoming monsters due to the roles assigned to them during the experiment. They were predisposed to these behaviours. A more critical criticism, secondly, concerns the issue of diversity among the guards. Typically, when this experiment is recounted, it's implied that all the guard participants turned into monsters. However, these abusive behaviours were only displayed by around 30% of the guards. So, the overwhelming majority of guards resisted the assigned roles and the encouragement for both them and Zimbardo to become monstrous. This undermines the major message propagated by those who talk about this experiment. Most people, even in situations of unlimited power, continue to hold on to their humanity. Yet when you look at those who recount this experiment, they claim that it proves everyone is a hidden monster. Of course, our circumstances can lead us to be more aggressive or cruel than usual. That's not surprising. During World War II, we know that even the most ordinary seeming individuals committed horrific acts under the Nazi banner. What matters is how much we can resist these impulses. Frankly, if we consider the overall result of the Stanford Prison Experiment, we see that the overwhelming majority of individuals were able to resist these impulses. Uh, so, the claim made by those who recount the experiment that turning into a monster is an inevitable behavior isn't accurate. Additionally, interviews with the participants revealed some, some significant issues. For instance, do you recall the first dropout of the experiment, Prisoner 8612? In a 2017 interview with this participant, Douglas Corby, he admitted intentionally screaming things like, Oh my God, I can't bear it anymore. Get me out of here. After just 36 hours to escape the experiment, this was because Corby believed he could continue studying for his classes during the experiment. But the guards in their warden roles prevented him by taking away his books. However, Corby had a graduate level exam to pass, which required him to exit the experiment. Failing to make himself heard, he resorted to acting as if he had gone mad. He even expressed regret for not pressing charges for false imprisonment back then. Lastly, a more significant problem emerges. Subsequent replications of the experiment yielded results that were diametrically opposed to Zimbardo's. For instance, in an experiment conducted by the BBC and aired on television, the guards and prisoners displayed efforts to build a relatively egalitarian and fair system instead of resorting to the same throat-gripping behaviours as in the Stanford experiment. Of course, that experiment is not flawless. For example, the knowledge that the experiment would be televised could have positively influenced the participants' behaviour. But that's the point. The conditions under which the experiment is conducted directly affect the participants' behaviour, leading to misrepresented outcomes. Moreover, while follow-up experiments could yield vastly different results, how can we make sweeping generalizations about human nature based on a single experiment? Doesn't that seem true? You see, these kinds of isolated experiments can often be popularized in the public sphere and through science communicators. Yet, when you delve into the academic aspect, 
you realise that these exaggerated popular narratives are far from accurate. Most importantly, you recognise that the notion suggested by these narratives that human nature is entirely determined and we would all turn into monsters under the right circumstances is not supported by evidence. Unfortunately, even psychology textbooks shy away from extensively discussing these current findings or criticisms related to the experiment. However, these details are crucial. Because one of the most dangerous trends I've witnessed lately is the tendency to attribute the cause of the current dire situations to the inevitable result of human nature and attempt to escape the responsibility. Blaming the biological or psychological nature of humans rather than individuals or societies is a perilous behaviour. If you buy into this, you could easily fall into the belief that you have little influence over the outcomes and get trapped in some of the worst and most useless forms of fatalism. Therefore, when discussing experiments that make claims about human nature, the boundaries and potential errors must be explicitly highlighted. I hope this video has managed to achieve this to some extent extent. Instead of waiting for a saviour when feeling helpless, always remember that you must be your own saviour. With the hope that this remains ingrained until the next video, farewell. Farewell. Farewell.